welcome to another episode of Chatty Broads with Becca and Jess. What is going on, Broads? Hey, Broads. Hey, Hey, Broads. broads. Um, Today, we have a great guest, and... uh, we're, I mean, we're going to hop just right into it after this. It is an, a very organic convo that we start out with or, with organic Olivia. A wonderfully organic conversation with the wonderful organic Olivia. Um, Super informative. I loved chatting with her. She's yeah. wonderful. Um, so knowledgeable. So knowledgeable. She's one of those people that I feel like, I'm like, okay, now that we're like friends via podcast, when I have a problem, <laughs> you're, can I, I can message you, you directly, right? And you can prescribe you're gonna me give supplements. Me your, you're going to give me your cell phone, right? So I can call you at any point in the in the night when I'm feeling a certain kind of way and you can yes. tell me what to do. Please and thank you. She Sounds was, good. <laughs> she's fantastic. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. By the way, we're calling her Organic Olivia because... Her Instagram handle and sort of like her brand name is Organic Olivia. She's an herbalist. She's a cool person. Uh, Yeah. And actually, before we get into that episode, you know, we say this often. And I'm sure as you're listening, whether you're driving in your car to your central job or, or cooking or cleaning, you probably just tune out during this part. But I'm asking you to tune in. Yes. <laughs> That's right. We're asking you to rate us on Apple Podcasts. Yes. Please. Thank Please. you. So many of you already have. And if you have, seriously, especially I, some people take the time to write out reviews. And that is incredible. And that we is so appreciate it. It's so encouraging. It's it's it makes doing this is everything. See, reading those reviews, it's just the nicest, most wonderful thing. Thank you if you have done that. Also, Becca, I am voting for you for next president because that was a very motivating Com- speech. Was it compelling? It was Thank very you. compelling, very compelling. And if you um, don't have the time to type it out, all you have to do is go to the Apple Podcasts app and you can just tap how many stars you want to rate us. I mean, hopefully it's four or five. Fingers listen, crossed. Listen, Becca is going to give birth soon and this is how you can give her, this is the birth gift. This is okay. my baby shower gift, guys. Shower her with five stars. <laughs> Showers and five star reviews. Please thank you. And you know why it's actually such a big deal to us? This is gonna sound sort of silly, but it's kind of like podcast clout. So when we want to have big guests, like when if when people are asked to go on podcasts, you can't look up like how many downloads or listens someone mm-hmm. gets. The only thing you can look at is the number of their reviews, which is kind of crazy. True. That so is for, so wild, huh? It's it is really pretty wild. So like for a big name or a big star deciding whether or not to come on our podcast, all their PR person or manager or whatever has to go off of is number of reviews. So if we can amp up those review numbers, hopefully we can amp up the stars we get on our show. <laughs> We're going to have five stars come raining down and stars of the Hollywood. So can you imagine all of a sudden? Glamorous. <laughs> bro- <laughs> we go from you know, like, like we loving have, interviewing like- <laughs> our broad squad and like the guests that we loved all of a sudden. Like this is a full blown celebrity podcast. We only we only record in our faux fur with our long cigarettes and our martinis. And we only have a listers only <laughs> a listers if- only. And we only talk about a-list shit okay that's yes. all we talk about yes if you didn't come to record in an uber black <laughs> or with your personal chauffeur you're not allowed craig we love you but you're bye bye honey kick to the curb craig sorry about it <laughs> <laughs> but for real it's actually really helpful if you just take the time to even just tap stars rating you don't even have to write out a review although we love those um so yeah we do love those so that's our that's our pitch to you, bro. That's our plug. And Please. We love you all. And also just one other quick thing is I just wanted to say another big shout out. I know we've shouted them out before, but our broad squad Facebook group is just coming in hot these days. Um, seeing broad supporting broads all over the place. Like since the whole pandemic started and a lot of people lost jobs, we're seeing on our Chatty Broads Facebook group that is run by broads. All of you guys supporting each other, supporting each other's small business, posting about it, zooming together. Ugh, I, it, it just warms our hearts so much. So shout out to all of you. Um, we'll uh, the link is in the bio of our 
um, Instagram at Chatty Broads that you can join the Facebook group again run by broads. Thank you all so much. And without further ado, let's hop into this episode with Organic Olivia. And just so you broads know, this episode is about to start out very organically because the day that we recorded with Olivia, um, and thankfully we had pressed record, uh, but before the official episode had actually started and we did the intro and everything, we asked um, Olivia, quote unquote, off mic, how she was doing, how she's been handling quarantine and everything. And we had no idea, but she started to share with us about how her mother and father had both gotten coronavirus and how she had gotten it as well. And we so appreciate her um, allowing us to keep it in the episode and her being so vulnerable and willing to share what's been going on with her family. Um, And so what you're about to hear is Olivia telling us about when her mother and father found out that they both had coronavirus. This is where we are. Oh so I didn't, I didn't think they had it because their symptoms, they kept telling me they had food poisoning. They were oh. like, we have these weird GI symptoms. It feels like we have food poisoning really? and like a cold. And so for like two weeks, they just had these terrible gut symptoms, these GI symptoms. And I went to class because I just finished my last year of herbalism school and we had a class on coronavirus that day and my teacher kept saying remember in Chinese medicine there's a lung and large intestine connection so if there's dampness in the lungs you're going to have damp symptoms in the gut too and as soon as he said that it just clicked for me and I ran out of class and I called my dad and was like I think you have coronavirus and he was like I'm starting to think that too. So I called my doctor and she was like, get in your car, leave your school, take your parents to the hospital. And I got to their house and my dad was like, no, 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 we don't need to go to the hospital. Like we'll go tomorrow. Like I have to get your mom up and showered. She's not going to want to go to the hospital without a shower. And I go in the room and she's like on the brink of death. So there's no possible way (gasps) she could have showered. She was hypoxic. She was, if, if I didn't find her that night, she would not have survived. Oh my God. She was like on the bed having fever dreams, like couldn't get up, couldn't open her eyes, couldn't stand up. And so I had to call an ambulance. And even at that moment, my dad was like, do not call an ambulance. She's going to be embarrassed. And I was like, this is not about embarrassment. (laughs) This is not the time to be a stubborn Italian dad. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, so I called the ambulance. They came in and got her. And even at that moment, my dad, you know, they both have it. He has a fever. He like goes into my old room, puts on regular clothes, and the EMT guy's like, You all right, sir? And he's like, Yeah, I'm totally fine. I have no symptoms, like dripping sweat from his fever. And I'm like, Dad, tell the man you have coronavirus. <laughs> oh, oh my God. So then yeah. w- once they went to the hospital, did, like how long were they there? So they both went to the hospital, the same hospital that was near their house. They admitted admitted my mom immediately because, again, she was, like, yeah. severely hypoxic, already had, like, advanced pneumonia. And, again, they didn't, have oh my any, God. they didn't have any lung symptoms. It was just gut symptoms. So at that time, we didn't know that there was 50% of people get GI symptoms and already have, like, lung damage. And they have no idea. Oh, my God, I had no they idea. They had no idea. So... My mom was admitted and then my dad, they were like, well, we gave him some fluids and like, you know, we got his, we gave him a little oxygen and he seems fine and he wants to go home. So we're going to release him. There's nothing else we can do. Cause again, this was like the very beginning of March cause they contracted it in February. So it was the beginning of March and, and they were like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. We don't really know about the virus. So I'm just going to, we're just going to send him home. And I was like, you can't just send him home alone to his house when he's sick. And so I took him to my house And like, obviously I had to deal with the fact that I would probably get it from him, which I did. And, uh, I took him to my house and tried to take care of him the best I could. And within like two days, he was, it just happened so fast. He just went downhill and he was in the same state my mom was in. So called an ambulance again, and he went to the hospital near my house. So both of my parents were in different hospitals at this point. Oh my God. And my mom was put on a ventilator that day. So she was on a ventilator for like two and a half weeks. And unfortunately it caused really bad brain damage. So (laughs) yeah, she's like probably never going to be the same. She's in rehab right now, but. uh, Oh my God. I am so sorry. Thank you. Wait, (laughs) I know. I know. It's like not what we, (laughs) yeah, it's, it's, 
it was, it's just been like a crazy, like I've just been going through this since like the beginning of March. So to me now I'm almost like numb. I'm like, this is my life. This is what happened. I have to accept it. I have to do what I can. But my dad got out of the hospital after like a month. Um, he ended up taking the hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromycin drug combination that everyone's debating about. And so did my mom. And that like, it, it got rid of the virus for them. So that's how my dad oh, wow. got well. Okay. Um, but it was like, you know, he was just in there for so long. And because it was two different hospitals, my dad's doctor was being more creative about like prescribing and trying these new treatments. And my mom's doctor wasn't. So I had to like take what that doctor was doing for him and what was working, call my mom's doctor, send him like studies. I had to be like, this is why they're giving him zinc with it. Can you try this with my mom? Can you try this antibiotic that my dad's on? It's working. His lungs are better. So I had to like communicate back and forth, got my mom's doctor to do everything they did for my dad. And within like three days of being on the drug combo, my mom got off the ventilator. So, which is like crazy because most people don't make it off. Wow. Oh my God. I'm just, I'm glad that she survived. Like I'm so grateful. And I fought super hard to like advocate for her. I didn't know how difficult the hospital system is and how hard it is to like get your voice heard and ask for things for your loved ones, especially when you're not there. Um, And one of the things I tried to advocate pretty hard for was the feeding tube formula when she was on the ventilator, because Mm. I didn't realize that there's, you know, there's formulas that corporations make. And if you look at the ingredients, a lot of the times it's just like cornstarch and soy oil. And I never even thought about that, about the shit that they're putting in feeding tubes. I never thought about it either. And thank God, you know, because I have like an Instagram following when they saw me going through this, so many people who work in hospitals reached out and were like, you need to check the formula ingredients. You need to check this. And I'm like, I I never thought of it. So I ended up getting uh, through to like patient advocate services, which is basically like, we're going to make sure you don't sue us and had to like weasel my way with them to get them to change her formula. I like bought this formula that had actual nutrients and whole foods in it and convinced them to change it. And the dietitian was really rude to me when I wanted to change her formula And, you know, that helped too. Like that really, I feel like that's part of why she made it through, but. It's so crazy. I always thought of the feeding tube formulas as literally just being like blended up food. Like, I don't know why I I think of it that way. And then I'm, that's crazy. Yeah. So so she's now in, in rehab because of. My mom already had dementia, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't debilitating. Like she, my father was her caretaker full time and she could do everything on her own. She could walk, talk, shower. Like she just would forget what you told her five minutes ago and she would get paranoid, like usual early stage Alzheimer's kind of stuff. But after being on the ventilator, because it damages your lungs and your brain, like there's post ventilator syndrome. And because they gave her really heavy sedatives and paralytic agents while she was on the ventilator, a lot of those drugs just kind of damaged her brain, messed with her brain. And, and she lost a few years, like she, her disease progressed really Mm. badly due to that. And I'm sure also just due to the inflammation of the virus, like there's many factors, but, um, the ventilator is what saved her life. But at the same time, it, you know, it, it created a pretty stark outcome for her. So now she's in a rehab facility where they're like teaching her how to walk and eat and do all these things again. But because of the COVID restrictions, we can't go see her. You can't go to any sort of rehab facility, right. nursing home or hospital. So I haven't seen her since that day I called the ambulance. Can your dad? No. And he oh. has a negative oh test. I mean, he has the antibodies and I, right. I, mean, I have them too. I got coronavirus too. So. And you guys That's can't so... see her. And it's can't see her. The end of February. Yeah. Well, since, yeah, they got it end of February and I called the ambulance March 9th. I think that was oh like the God. day that. That's really realized. crazy that people with the antibodies can't, that doesn't make any sense. They're yeah. literally like the safest people. You can't get it and you can't give it to anybody. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, we've been trying to like How frustrating. Plead, plead with them and call the department of health and say like, please, you know, he has all the records of being positive, then testing negative, then having the antibodies, like this person is safe, but they just won't allow it. And so we've just been kind of like FaceTiming with her, but she's a, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that it's because she's only 65. So it's hard to believe that a 65 year old woman like progressed that badly and is in such a bad stage. But 
that's just what happened. So that's then, been my quarantine. And then, you, and then you got it. Yeah. My boyfriend and I got it. It's, it's interesting because again, my parents' symptoms were mainly digestive. They were like really bad gas, really bad diarrhea, and then a few days of constipation and it's not that um, burping and stuff. And so as soon as I was exposed to my dad, and especially when I brought him to my house, yeah, my boyfriend and I instantly started having the same gas and bowel symptoms that he had to the point where our gas even smelled exactly the same. So we oh, knew serious? instantly. Yeah, like we knew we were infected because our gas smelled identical. That's so gross. But it was like, I, at that moment, I was like, okay, I have it. Got it. So oh I just God. stopped like wearing a mask around him because like he's in my house and I didn't want to make him feel like a leper. I was like, I just was, I thought my dad was going to die. So I just took my mask off and was just kissing his forehead and like mm. hugging him. And, you know, I just, when I called the ambulance the second time for him to go back, I, I thought that was like the last moment I'd ever see him because I knew my mom was already on a ventilator and I thought that was his future too. Um, so I just, like, I was on my hands and knees, like, I'm so sorry, dad, but I had to call an ambulance. You're not safe here. You need to be in yeah. a hospital. Yeah. And he was so mad at me. And I was just like saying my final goodbyes. I really thought I was going to lose him. Oh my God. God. Yeah. But yeah, so for me, the symptoms were, were just gut symptoms. I had like from the day I was around him and knew that I was infected, it took 11 days for things to come to a head. So there is that incubation period that I saw firsthand. Okay. And um, throughout those 11 days, I just had horrible, horrible bowel symptoms. It was like I had IBS again. I had terrible stomach cramping, diarrhea, um, a lot of nausea and like food aversions. I just could not eat. Yeah. And then on the 11th day, the same thing happened to my dad. Like he had it for like 11 to 14 days. He had a day where he felt a little better, got his appetite back. And then he had this intense craving for ice cream. He ate the ice cream and then his symptoms exploded. And that's when his fever came back and he got into like the second stage of the illness. So same for me. On day 11, I started feeling better. I was like, oh my God, I want to eat something. And I had this insatiable craving for peanut butter. And so I ate these peanut butter pretzels. And all of a sudden, my chest started aching. My, the, the gut symptoms I was having like tripled. I just felt like there was this rock in my stomach. I was like doubled over on the bed, like putting pressure on my stomach. It was so painful. Oh my and God. I just started to have this dry cough and my, my lungs and my chest were aching. And I was like, that's it. I'm, I'm going to die. I need to go to the hospital. And then I called my doctor and she was like, listen, yes, you have it, but you need to relax. You're going to be fine. You're going to have a day <laughs> or two of chest pain and you're going to get over it. Cause her husband is in medical school they had all just had it. She got it from him and she just had it. So she's like, a lot of people in New York have already had it. You're young. You're not in the condition your parents are. You're going to get over it in a few days. And sure enough, I did. I just used my herbal knowledge, looked at my tongue, was like, what, what does my body need right now? Just did a lot of teas, a lot of tinctures. And within a few days, I felt absolutely fine. I've definitely heard that that's like the, the, um, that's typical though of like that two that kind of two week period and people think they're better and then all of a sudden it just hits like with a fury again. yeah and it was like it was just lingering hanging out waiting for me to eat something because i i don't do well with peanut butter on a daily like that's something i don't really eat often because it already craving it and i was craving Weird. this everyone i know because i have a lot of friends now that have had it because again we're in new york it's like a lot of people have had yeah. it here so all my friends who have had it had the same thing where there was one turning point day where they either craved ice cream or something really sugary or peanut butter or something. And then everything came to a head and got a lot worse the next day. So nice. it's, it's like the pathogen just hides out and waits for you to eat something that it can kind of have a party with. And then it, it goes for it. Cause I was eating so clean in those 11 days leading up to it. Cause I knew I had the virus and was being extra careful. Wow. Well, speaking of you using, talking about eating clean and using herbs, we just hopped right into this conversation because we were talking about how, how you're doing during this time. We are joined by the amazing Organic Olivia. <laughs> how are Hello, you? Brad. Other than everything else that's going on. I'm doing oh well. 
my and goodness. Honestly, I have to say, you guys got me through my final year of herbalism school because every oh Tuesday morning on my long commute, when I would listen to your recaps, it was my saving grace. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, Brad, so we got to take a quick pause. Um, speaking of organic Olivia, in light of recent events, I have been looking at my health from a way more holistic approach. Everything we do affects our overall well-being, whether that's your mental health, the sustenance you're putting into your body, um, your movement, and of course, your quality of sleep. Attitudes premier bamboo bedding is changing the way people, myself included, sleep and live. And I have noticed a huge difference since making the switch. Um, I know I've said it 1000 times, but my God, these are the most comfortable sheets that have ever touched my body. I preach the word of attitude to everyone I can. I'm sitting on my attitude uh, duvet cover right now. I never Ugh. knew sleeping on bamboo would be such a game changer, but oh my gosh. These sheets are amazing. And like Jess said, they support your sleep health, which supports your health overall. So these sheets are antimicrobial, which is crazy. And they're proven to kill 99.9% .9 of microorganisms. And plus, if you have sensitive skin, they're hypoallergenic, so they won't irritate your skin in the slightest bit. And while their sheets contribute to your overall wellness, they also contribute to the wellness of the planet. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. uh, Attitude makes efforts at every point in their manufacturing process to save energy and water while eliminating the use of toxic chemicals so often found in bedding. So why not try Attitude? Uh, you're going to love them. But on the off chance you don't, which would be shocking to me, shocking. But on the off chance, all sets have a 30-day risk-free trial uh, if you're not fully satisfied, you can return your sheets for a full refund, and Etitude will even cover the shipping on returns. Etitude sheets, they're soft as silk. They're breathable as linen, but they're at the price of cotton, so you're going to love them. And right now, our listeners will get 20% off their sheet set and free shipping. So you just have to text CHAT to 64000, and that's the only way to get 20% off your set of Etitude sheets and free shipping. You got to text chat to 64,000. That's C H A T to 64000. And you're based in New York? <laughs> yes, in New York. How's so it my, going? My herbal school's in Brooklyn, but I live in the suburbs a little bit outside of the city, like 30 minutes outside. So my commute was super long and I would just listen to the recaps. And honestly, the two hour recaps were so much better than the two hour episodes. I guess. <laughs> yes. Take that, ABC. I mean, we're a little biased, <laughs> but we kind of think the same thing. So good. Oh my God. Those episodes are drawn out. Um, so did you already finish herbalism school or are you, is this your last year? I did. I just had my last class on Sunday. So I'm all done. It. We, we went online, uh, obviously, with coronavirus, right. but... Um, it was congratulations. Sad to not have Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, it's sad to not have that graduation fun finish. I know. Yes, I was. I was supposed to be graduating this spring, and I'm low key kind of happy that plans changed and I'm graduating next spring because I'm like, maybe I'll get to wear a cap and gown and walk. Oh, like, bitch, yes. you better be wearing a cap and gown. I'm going. I'm taking all those pictures. Well, I'm like, I, I hope a year from now that they're not still limiting those yeah. kind of events i'll i'll I take it so i'll do it paparazzi style i'll be in the bushes somewhere <laughs> well can you explain like what being an herbalist is like what you do obviously i'm sure a lot of our listeners know about you from your instagram platform um if you don't know uh, olivia has an incredible instagram called organic olivia um i recently like started diving into it and your youtube um and your new podcast what's the juice incredible so informative yeah thank so, you so much yeah yeah so can you yeah. give us a little explanation absolutely yeah, and, and how did so, you get interested in the first place I think too. of course yeah so I am an herbalist uh, now that I finished school I'm going to be a clinical herbalist where I will see clients but I don't work with people the way that a doctor would or a different practitioner would we're kind of our role is to be supportive and to teach people how to harness the power of plants how to use them as tools how to use teas tinctures capsules everything like that for digestive issues for 
um, you know, soothing their nerves, anxiety, everything like that to kind of um, teach people how to use their plant allies in their daily life as part of an integrative protocol. So often as herbalists, we do work with a client's doctor or other practitioners and we'll often call them up and say, hey, you know, the client is on this medication and I want to use this herb with them. Is that all right? So it's a very integrative process and I feel really proud as an herbalist to be part of someone's healthcare team um, and to teach them above all. I think being an herbalist is being an educator and that's why I love sharing on Instagram and YouTube and on my podcast so much because you're really um, kind of teaching people how to educate themselves and then go on to share that ripple effect with others and get back in touch with these plants that we used to rely on for so many things. Um, you know, you think about grandmothers, they used to be the medicine women of the town and they would have a remedy for every ailment. And we used to really rely on this grandmother medicine. And while we've made such incredible advancements with modern medicine, I think that there's a really beautiful way that the two can coexist. Mm -hmm. And I think more than ever, we're starting to study um, these traditional usages of plants in the lens of science. And we're seeing that people two, three, 5,000 years ago really had some insight to share with us. And you, you think about how did they know these things? They learned it from just observing the natural environment and kind of following the cycle. So I'm all about going back to traditional wisdom and trying to find simple fixes before going to the big dogs, um, mm. which would be very necessary for many people. Again, I, I never want to poo-poo on Western medicine. I think it's a collaboration. Well, I think um, the cool thing between of like Eastern medicine or alternative medicine versus Western is it's not that it replaces the other, but the focus is more on prevention rather than yes. fixing the problem mm. after the problem's already there. So Absolutely. if you can combine the two, then you can eliminate a lot of problems that have to lead to, you know, whatever forms of Western medicine, because you're already keeping your body in like a state of homeostasis and balance and all that kind of thing. So that's Absolutely. the cool thing about it. I feel like people assume that being an herbalist means you're like, oh, you have this serious infection. Let's like <laughs> wave garlic over your body. And it's like, no, it's about keeping you healthy so that you don't end up with these problems in the first place. Exactly. If I do my job right, then you will have to rely on seeing a doctor for more serious issues in the future a lot less. So it's totally that collaboration. I love that you have that perspective on it and that appreciation of it. Thank you so much because a lot of people don't realize that. So <laughs> I think what's cool, cool too is you using your social media platform. It's like um, social media makes things so much more digestible too, where I think even like 20 years ago, you'd have to be reading all these crazy books or like consulting people. And I think it's so neat that you can make a post about one thing mm -hmm. and people can have these bites of information. Yeah. It's all about really distilling neat. it down and making it bite size and making it understandable and using metaphors. And that's why I love traditional medicine so much. Cause like I said, they really observed what was going outside and mirrored that within their own bodies. So for example, with Chinese medicine, they always say to eat your largest meal of the day when the sun is the strongest in the sky, because your digestive fire is going to kind of mimic mm. the fire of the sun. And when the sun goes down, your digestive fire is not as strong. So eating a lot at night before bed, of course, makes you feel pretty crappy. So there's these metaphors and this storytelling that comes in with traditional medicine that really helps you to remember these things. And a lot of traditional wisdom is really simple and really free. I think mm -hmm. also being an herbalist and even having my own supplement line, um, sometimes people think wellness is very expensive and it can be, and I'm a supplement junkie myself, but I think the most basic things that I can do for someone and the most basic things I can remind them of are often the most powerful. Mm. Even going back to assessing someone's oral care or asking them about their oral hygiene routine because your microbiome starts in your mouth and then goes to your gut. So, so often I'm just telling people floss at night, brush your teeth after each meal, drink some green tea and swish with it. And actually your gut issues are going to get a lot better because you're getting to the root. So it's these simple things that I just need to remind people of and work with them on. And people see a lot of improvements just by mm. getting back to basics. So how'd you get started in this field? What so I got interest started, in the first place? Yeah, I, I had a lot of um, health issues growing up. I was just always like the sick kid. Um, always had different infections. I mean, I took that like pink amoxicillin, good tasting antibiotic liquid. Yeah. So <laughs> many times. 
I was like, yay, I get more of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, fun. Yeah. so my mom was ended up sneaking antibiotics into Wendy's cheeseburgers. And that, of course, little tidbit will show you kind of how my diet was. It was very fast food heavy. My parents never really cooked. It was the 90s. They were like, you know, we're just going to pop a Jimmy Dean breakfast sausage sandwich into the microwave and you're going to be fine. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I just had always felt like something was kind of wrong with me because I just never felt good. Mm -hmm. I never, um, you know, my gut was never right. My digestion was always off. I was always constipated. I was always fatigued. I had anxiety and depression from a really, really young mm -hmm. age. Um, and just kind of felt different from the rest of the world and always knew that something was going on. And uh, with all that fast food, I was also overweight as a kid. And the first time I went into Weight Watchers was sixth grade and I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And I like counted the points wrong. And I thought that one peanut butter and jelly sandwich was like my total points for the day. So I would oh, eat like gosh. one quarter <laughs> at a time. It was so bad. Um, but by the time I got to high school, things really um, came to a head for the first time. And I decided to kind of educate myself on nutrition because I felt like that was really a big missing piece in my puzzle. And I realized that if I ate well, I felt less anxious and less depressed. Um, at this point, I was also still seeing my doctor and I was on a lot of different pharmaceuticals. Um, mm -hmm. So I was on antidepressants and I was on antispasmodics because I ended up getting diagnosed with IBS after all those years of constipation and stomach issues. Um, I was on a lot of antibiotics in those years for acne because it started kind of expressing through my skin. And I was just really tired of being on so many different prescriptions mm -hmm. and not really feeling much better. And in fact, having side effects from those that often required other prescriptions. And yep. so I just started questioning things and learned about nutrition. And I really felt like if I could just get the right base education, I could go my own way with it and not only help myself, but help other women. So um, when I got into college, I wanted to do nutrition, but my college where I got a scholarship only offered pre-med. So I was like, I guess I'm going to be a doctor then. <laughs> so I entered the pre-med program and the way it works in any uh, like pre-med setup is that they pile a lot of classes on you because if you're not serious, they kind of want to weed out the people who aren't ready for it. Right. So it was extremely stressful. And my IBS and acne and all of these odd issues that my doctor would always say, you know, maybe it's autoimmune, but we won't know until you have a full-blown autoimmune disorder. So just wait it out. It all just kind of exploded. Mm. And um, I remember going to my doctor like every single morning before my 8 a.m. class, getting more blood drawn trying to figure out what was wrong. My lymph nodes underneath my armpit and in my groin were really swollen. And I was just this ball of like mystery health issues that no one could explain. Um, and so one day I was in class, I was so uncomfortable. I was in so much stomach pain. And I just thought there has to be another way. Why don't I try another modality? So I had heard a lot about like acupuncturists and traditional Chinese herbs. And so at the time, I don't even know what year this was. It must have been like 2012 or, yeah, 2012. Um, I had gone on Yelp and <laughs> when Yelp was a thing and I typed in like <laughs> traditional Chinese herbalist and I found some like shop in, in Mount Vernon, New York. And I ran out of my chem class <laughs> and got in my car and drove to this acupuncturist in this little store. And at the time... I had heard certain things from my doctor when he was trying to figure out what was going on with me. I had heard that my liver enzymes were elevated. I had heard that I might have some sort of a virus or EBV. That's why my lymph nodes were swollen. Um, and I had I obviously knew I had stomach issues. Mm -hmm. So I walked into this guy's office and he took one look at me and said, stick out your, your tongue. Was he an Ayurvedic doctor? He was, a, he was an acupuncture or a doctor okay, okay. of oriental medicine. So he okay. could do acupuncture and herbs. So he looked, took one look at me, could clearly see I was flustered and in pain and pissed. And he said, stick out your tongue for me. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? I'm like, how, 
where am I? Am I yeah. in an alternate <laughs> universe? So I'm like, fine. I stick out my tongue at this guy and he's like, oh my God, your poor liver. And I'm like, wait, my liver, my doctor just said my liver enzymes were through the roof. And he's like, yes, you have all this heat in your liver. You have a lot going on in your stomach and your intestines. He's like, do you have um, any stomach symptoms or pain or, or bowel issues? And I'm like, absolutely. And he's like, yeah, I think that you have some gut infections. I think you have parasites. I think you maybe have some fungal overgrowths. Um, and definitely your liver is not happy right now. So he gave me a few different herbs to take. One of them was like a capsule. Um, he gave me some anti-parasitic herbs. And then he gave me something called fluorescence, which is like a, it's considered an alternative tea, but it helps your liver, your kidneys, and your lymphatic system, all your elimination organs. And he just wanted to kind of open things up, cool them down, and start to get rid of some of these gut infections that I was dealing with. And I'm like, okay, well, I had a stool test done at my doctor a million times because I know I have IBS. So they always test me and it always comes back negative. So how could I possibly have parasites? Like I've never traveled out of the country before. So it didn't make sense to me, but I, whatever. I bought these things from this guy and I took them anyway. And not only did I end up passing worms, but <sighs> within like a week, not only were my lymph nodes going down and not as hot and red and swollen, but all of this cystic acne that I had on my forehead, cheeks, my back was all starting to get less angry, less inflamed and started to flatten a little bit. Wow. And I was like, whoa, my stomach feels better. I'm not as hot and angry. I'm not as constipated. My skin is better. I think this is all connected. And obviously he was onto something with my gut. So I went back to my doctor like a few months later after I was feeling so much better and had started learning about Chinese medicine on my own. And I showed him pictures of some of the parasites that I passed. And I was like, dude, you did so many stool tests with me. I <laughs> don't think this was wrong. <laughs> I'm like, how do you explain this? And he just looked at me and said, listen, I'm going to write down the name of this parasite doctor in the city. He can find parasites in anyone. I want you to go see him, but I can't talk to you about this. And just like slipped me his name and number and was what like, What the fuck? So like, like black he just, market parasite doctor. It was so odd. He wasn't even like open to having a conversation about Wait, it. Wait, why and do you think that is now? Like, I just think he's very, when I mentioned, oh, I took herbs and got this parasite out or I'm using herbs, like he just instantly was very closed off to it and mm. was like, this is not my realm. I don't want to know about this. And I think in many ways, he's so used to his paradigm and his mm -hmm. way of helping patients that if he opens up to this whole world that he hasn't been doing, he's got to reshift everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'd have to question everything. It'd be a total mind fuck. So he's like, look, I know that this is a thing. I've sent other people to this guy. And this man was like, I think he's like 92 or 93 years old now. He's this little like Irish guy and he comes in the room and he literally sticks his finger in your butt <laughs> and like swabs it and looks at it under a microscope and he does like old fashioned testing. It's not a stool test that's sent out to some lab. Like he yeah. looks at you, he puts a camera in there. He was like, oh wow, like you're, you're very inflamed. All your tissue is very red. You've clearly had parasites for a while now. So... <laughs> Come to wow. find out, I did have not only parasites, but just an overall microbiome imbalance where there mm. was a lot more opportunistic, pathogenic bacteria in my gut versus what we look at as probiotics and beneficial bugs. So I really spent a lot of time after that using herbs that are antimicrobials, but not necessarily as unforgiving as antibiotics. They're sort of selective in the way that they um, kill off certain species of opportunistic pathogens. So I spent a lot of time getting to know these herbs using things like wormwood and clove and black walnut hull and garlic and ginger and ended up, yes, like really rebalancing my gut, getting a lot of things out, mm. um, getting my bowels moving regularly, which had never happened to me before in my life. I finally wasn't bloated. And I noticed that the more that I worked on my gut, the better my skin looked. And I never thought in my life that I would get rid of my cystic acne because it was so severe. Yeah. And then I learned about the gut-skin axis, the gut-brain axis. 
I ended up um, getting off of the antidepressants that I was on. And again, not to say that that's not very necessary for some people, but I wanted to see if I could try another route and if working on my gut could also improve my mental health. And it did. And for me, that was my answer. And so I just kind of started my blog that year and was like, I'm going to just document what's happening to me and what herbs I'm taking and how my skin is improving. And I started sharing my journey as a beginner and over time just kind of learned with my audience and eventually put out my first formula, which was based on the very first herbs that I ever took to clear the infections in my gut. It's like a a parasite Mm. formula or a gut dysbiosis formula. And from there, I couldn't stop making products and learning about herbs. I went to school and now I have my whole line of products and I I teach people about the body holistically on a daily basis. So broads, it's springtime in Los Angeles, which happens to be one of my favorite seasons, but it happens to be synonymous with my least favorite season, which is allergy season. Uh, I, if you have any allergies, you know what I'm talking about. The runny nose itchy eyes. No, thank you. I get horrible allergies. They make me a terrible person. Um, It's like those little pollen bits follow me around and into my house and it's frustrating. And that's why we recently upgraded our home air purification system with Molecule, the best defense against allergy season, baby. Yes. Uh, Oh, baby. Until Molecule Air purifying systems hadn't been updated in almost 70 years, actually. The technology was really outdated, so that would leave allergens, bacteria, mold, and viruses just sitting dormant on filters. Or worse, um, it would allow them to multiply and release back into the air in your home. But now, Molecule has developed a technology that completely destroys these pollutants on a molecular level, so you can breathe easy all the time. I swear, as soon as we put a molecule uh, put molecule into our bedroom, I was not only breathing easier, but I was sleeping easier. Uh, my allergies always hit hard at nighttime, so it was well worth the investment. And I absolutely, definitely feel the difference. Also, I want my precious daughter breathing in good, clean air. And considering we live in a city, I want to take care of those lungs. And um, as if breathing in clean air wasn't enough of a perk, the molecule system is so beautifully designed. Before this, I thought that air filters were going to just be those clunky towers in the corner that you kind of yep, try to I've had hide, you know? it's it, That's what you typically think of. Well, Molecule's designs are clean and modern, and they fit seamlessly into any room in your home. I know, and I love having the windows open for fresh air, but then, like, living in a big city, like you're saying, I'm like, that's yeah. not fresh. That's not fresh air. No, um, it definitely is not. <laughs> no. But now, Molecule even offers their breakthrough technology across a range of products, providing solutions for the entire home when it comes to air purification. So whether you need the Molecule for large rooms or the Molecule Air Mini for smaller rooms, you can now choose the unit that's best for your space, or you can create a bundle to provide an air purification solution for your entire home. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit Molecule.com and enter code CHATTY at checkout. That's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. And enter code chatty at checkout for 10% off your first order. So molecule with a K. Becca, can we talk about my Lord and Savior during this at home all the time, 2020 times? Uh, Without a doubt, it is audible. Oh my gosh. Oh God. Maybe maybe the first few weeks I did a lot of binge TV watching, which blessings all good. But I started to feel a little empty inside, a little anxious with all the television watching. So I switched over to Audible and that, my broads, did the trick for me. Oh, my gosh. I got my phone stolen last week. And one of the biggest grievances was that I don't have my Audible. Oh, that is Audio a tragedy. <laughs> when I need to do my chores around the house. Ugh. Ugh. Well, This is why we love Audible. It's the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, self-development, everything. And every month, members get one credit to pick any title. Plus, you get two Audible originals from a monthly selection. I just downloaded one that's like a... It's like an audio play with like Paul Rudd and a bunch of other random people in it, which is really fun to listen to. Uh, And you get access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, 
as well as guided meditation programs. Um, let's see, I've been listening to two books. Um, I'm always on my David Sedaris kick and Gray and I love to listen to that if we have to go in the car somewhere together. And then on my own, I've been listening to an audio book by, I'm going to butcher his name. It's either Juno Diaz or Juno, Juno Diaz, J-U-N-O-T. Sorry, don't know how to say the name, but it's fantastic. <laughs> well, even bigger blessings. Audible is offering something new. Audible Stories, audible.com slash stories is a place where anyone, anywhere can stream hundreds of titles, no strings attached, completely free. Uh, most of the titles are suitable for the whole family to listen to. No sign up required. Just explore the collection of audio titles for kids of all ages each title was handpicked by their talented editors to provide a balanced mix of education, entertainment, classics, and general in, general interest content. Uh, they have it in English, German, French, Spanish, Japanese, and Italian. And their hope is that Audible Stories will offer all of their listeners, including parents, educators, and caregivers, anyone helping kids as daily routines are disrupted, a screen-free experience to look forward to each day. And yes, it is completely free and there is no limit to how much content you can stream. Mm. Audible intends to keep offering Audible stories to people around the world for as long as the current situation continues. Pretty incredible. And to access this content, you just have to visit audible.com slash stories from computers, tablets, or smartphones. The experience is completely free, completely anonymous, no logins, credit cards, passwords, none of that required. You just click stream and listen. So this isn't through the app. You can find all this at online at audible.com slash stories. That's audible.com slash stories. Or text stories to 500, 500, stories to 500, 500. You're wow. really speaking to me because I, I mean, we talked about this a little bit. Jess had to go offline because her, everything shut down on her end, <laughs> but love, um, love the internet. I had such a similar background because like we were talking about, um, when we weren't recording, I dealt with the same things of like UTIs and yeast infections as a child, like acid reflux as like an 11 year old and and heartburn and like my young teens constantly constipated all the time the interesting thing was is that my mom was actually really like pretty health oriented and so I we didn't eat a lot of like um we didn't eat a lot of like cheap meat or animal products and like we ate a lot of like whole fruits and vegetables and all that but I always had like these missing pieces that were wrong and I, I, I just had like the, the very same experience. I didn't start getting acne until I was like 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. So I had super clear skin up until then. And I was like, sorry, everyone in junior high, like my <laughs> skin is like a baby's butt. What, and then all of, a sudden, all of a sudden I head to college and I'm like, dude, what the fuck is going on? And of course, when I'm seeing multiple dermatologists, when I'm seeing doctors, it's like, well, let's try putting you on birth control. OK, that didn't work. OK, let's try putting you on doxycycline okay that doesn't work let's try putting you on i can't remember what it's like a minocycline or something okay that yeah. didn't work okay let's try putting you on epiduo no that's not doing shit all right let's put you on accutane okay your acne came back six months later let's put you on accutane again okay your acne came back six months later let's put you on accutane again three times until the dermatologist literally told me you can't go on it again otherwise you could permanently fuck up your liver and like yeah. you were saying I was on antibiotics a lot as a kid and and the problem was is that I was having just gut issues forever because of a lot of unfortunately the antibiotics that I was on that yes. were causing wrecking even more havoc at the root cause of all of my issues mm -hmm. and then it literally wasn't until I started dating my boyfriend and he cooked everything with kimchi and it yes <laughs> crowd out Dude. the bad bugs that's the missing piece because you can treat your gut a million times but if you're not actively putting in good microbes and exposing yourself even to things like soil and forest air where you're breathing in spores then you're never correcting it at a root cause level yeah and I couldn't figure it out and it's so funny because um like my freshman year of college I would drink, it was actually like the really sugary strawberry kefir from Trader Joe's, but I drink it every day. <laughs> I was like, oh, it tastes so good. But crazy enough, even with that shit that has a lot of added sugar, my skin was clearing up. I didn't make the connection at all. It wasn't until I said like, I think two or three years later, 
I was having really bad acne, started dating my boyfriend, started eating kimchi. It was literally one week. It was one week of eating kimchi maybe two or three times and my skin started clearing up and I started doing some research and I was like, oh, fermented foods. Holy yeah. shit. My freshman year of college, I was drinking kefir, like fermented, fermented. Oh my God. And then I started just overloading on fermented foods mm -hmm. and boom, it was like, like you said, my digestive problems were going away. I was finally able to poop regularly. Totally. I finally wasn't waking up with swollen, like a swollen face and swollen cheeks yeah. and like all. Yeah. Anyway. So what you're saying is like totally speaking to me and it's, and it's so hard though, because and I was going to ask you about what your diet was like, because we have so much conflicting information it's a beautiful and horrible thing about the internet. I think so many people don't know where to start with healing yeah. their bodies. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that of like finding sources because every, Me. you know, people are like, <laughs> eat avocado. Don't eat avocado. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's like all this different competing information. It's right? really hard and, for people to sift through. And for someone like me who knows so very little about this world in general, like my parents, it was like junk food city all growing up that I remember when I started to see certain friends whose like bodies and lives and like stress and skin and all this were changing because they were changing the things that they were putting into their body. And I'm like, I want to get involved. But then when I started to dive in, yeah, I was hard because I'm going so like, wait, I, I don't know. <laughs> is this bad or is this good? Like, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's funny. I had a friend growing up who's, uh, parents were very crunchy and organic like the way I am now and I was the total opposite and I'll never forget one time we were in like the YMCA swimming in an indoor pool and her little brother was like why don't you go eat a cheeseburger and I turned around and was like why don't you go eat something organic <laughs> <laughs> and now look at me <laughs> but yes no and and to your point about um the history of like the gut and skin health I think modern medicine has it half right because they're giving doxycycline for acne. And for many people, when they're on that regimen, on that antibiotic that's killing off some of the bad bacteria in the gut, it temporarily works. So mm -hmm. that in itself should show you that there's that gut skin axis. But then you get off the antibiotics and you don't have anything to then replace yeah. the good bugs. It comes right back. And when you use really strong antibiotics and it indiscriminately kills everything off, you have this totally sterile state. And when there's a, a mucous membrane in the body that's totally sterile, that's when something called a biofilm can form where bugs can get a little stickier and start to work together and communicate and actually hide from your immune system. So over time, the infections get worse and worse because mm. you're creating this environment where the bugs can become super bugs. So if you're not actively eating fermented foods and your preferred source of probiotics and constantly intaking the good guys, the bad guys will take over. So it's a lifelong thing and it's going to be lifelong maintenance for me and I'm sure for you, Becca. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think, I think I've had such an evolution with changing my diet and it's taken me seven or eight years to get to the point where I am now where I really know what my body likes and I also know unfortunately my trigger foods and my food allergies and I don't think that there's when you look at whole foods even something like dairy that's been so um twisted from the original product of what it was especially with factory farming it's a really difficult topic. I think that's where people get confused because they think mm. they either have to cut everything or that everything's bad for them. And so much of it is nuanced. So there's a few sides of it, like with the dairy topic of where are you getting your dairy? Is it raw? Is it pasteurized? Is it from factory farmed cows? Are the cows healthy? What are they eating? And then there's the other side of, are you allergic to it? Can you even tolerate right. it? So these are very individual questions you have to ask yourself with every food. How do I feel after I eat it? Could I possibly have an intolerance or an allergy? And if I feel fine, can I source it better? Like where am I actually sourcing this product and how much thought am I putting into the quality of my food? So I never like to demonize any one food or diet, mm -hmm. but I do like to really emphasize to people to use minimal ingredients to try some sort of an elimination diet where you do cut out common trigger foods like gluten, dairy, soy, corn, um, and even things like nightshades or eggs are a problem for some. And then you slowly reintroduce them and you notice how your body feels. You actually give your body the space to talk to you so that you can listen. Um, and, and you just kind of make your own diet with what works 
for you. And unfortunately, when you do develop an allergy to something like dairy, where your immune system has learned to react to the protein, even if you cut it out or even if you source it really well, your immune response is always going to continue that learned behavior of reacting to the protein in dairy, the casein or the whey. Um, so you do unfortunately have to avoid your trigger foods for life, even if you do heal your gut. But I also think that there's a balance, a 90-10 balance of, you know, sometimes when I am on vacation or going to Italy where, where everything is really clean and animals are raised differently, I will have a little bit of dairy and I'll deal with a little bit of a stomach ache if I have to because that's balance and that's life. But on a daily basis when I'm eating to keep my inflammation as low as possible and really nourish my body, I just don't include the foods I react to. Right. So... Right. And I think also different preparations and stuff like for me, cultured milk and like kefir, it's, yes. it's, it's, there's no issue with it versus exactly. like drinking a straight cup of milk is different or like a sourdough bread, yes. like a fermented wheat versus like non. Yeah. And these are cultural traditions. These are how people used to consume things. And we've just kind of lost that. And we now skip those steps. We don't let the sourdough ferment for 48 hours and build up all those good cultures and microbes that help us to actually break it down. We don't ferment our dairy. We kind of go the quick way and we just have that cup of milk or we have that cheese and we don't think about it. We're not really consciously consuming these foods that are so precious. Um, so it's really about just putting thought into what you eat and keeping food as simple as possible. I really just do, I do a lot of one pan meals where I'll cut up some squash, you know, marinate some Brussels sprouts and some maple syrup and olive oil and whatever, pop them on the pan, get a piece of fish, marinate that or put some lemon and some spices on top of it. And I just pop that into the oven. And when you eat those three foods together, even though they're basically single ingredient foods, they kind of season each other and they work with each other and they taste really good. Mm -hmm. So the more whole food and the more color that you can get on your plate, I think the better off you're going to be. And we know that even the pigments that create the color in food, like those red staining pigments in berries, modulate your microbiome. The polyphenols in berries that make them that deep purple actually go in and not only kill off bad bacteria, but they create an environment, a terrain where healthy bacteria can then thrive. Wow. Yeah. And I also just wanted to add in about that eating. Like a lot of times you're going to have to take time to sort of like detox and train your body to even like those foods. Yes. And it yeah. may be really hard. For, I know for me, when I was dealing with candida overgrowth and all that kind of thing, as I was trying to eliminate processed sugars and stuff for for a time period, I like I I wasn't doing any dairy, no gluten, no processed sugar. And then now I'm at a healthier state and I can incorporate more of those foods. But at the time, um, I was having like crazy cravings. Like yeah. I was like, all I want, I, I hate cake. And I was like, I need white cake right now. <laughs> and like, I need, I hate frosting and shit. I was like, I need that. My body needs French fries. It was like a purge and it lasted like a month. But then once I was able to get past that, then I started craving, like, I would be like, oh, I want a bowl of spinach. And before I'd be like, what the fuck? I don't want a bowl of spinach. But sometimes I just want to encourage people that, like, once you start eating a more balanced diet, you're going to start craving those foods because your body's going to relearn, like, what it wants instead of trying to feed sugars to, like, overgrowths or or When I started, thing. like, I loved fried chicken and french fries like that was my favorite for chicken nuggets and french fries and when i started off just kind of changing my diet i would say how can i just recreate that food in a healthier way and i would just make it a challenge for myself because you're kind of mimicking the taste that you love but you're getting creative with the kitchen and in the kitchen <laughs> getting creative in the kitchen and getting uh, creative with the kitchen you're figuring out how you can just make healthier swaps of fan favorites so i would just bread my chicken in almond flour instead of you know, gluten instead of wheat flour, because I was cutting that out temporarily to see how I felt. So I would bread my chicken in the almond flour, I would fry it in coconut oil instead of canola oil, and I would cut french fries and I would bake them because it's still a potato. And that's still, you know, well sourced organic chicken with a breading that's not a common allergen. And I would eat that and it was delicious. And that's where I started. And that still made me feel amazing. And, and ever since then, I've just kind of refined it and kind of made it even simpler. Mm. Yeah. What do you recommend people? Oh, go ahead, Jess. Oh, no, I was just going to say like, like what uh, you were saying be about uh, just for people getting like discouraged, because that was always like, the big thing for me is that I'd be like, okay, 
I, and I'd go hard in the paint. I'm like, I'm going as <laughs> like, I'm only eating, you know, I'm going to eat celery because I, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So I would just be like, I'm only going to eat this type of food. I'm going to go so hard and it would be a week of this. And I'd be like this. I, I can't. This shit sucks. I'm like, yeah. I can't get myself to like this. All I want is, you know, all I want is pizza. All I want is this. And it definitely like for myself, uh, the only reason that anything shifted for me and I still am like, you know, definitely in this process of trying to get better at it. Um, but was when I had my, after I had my daughter, um, I, she was having these like crazy, like colicky, um, uh, reactions. And I could tell that it had to do with something I was eating. And so I just was like, I'm eliminating everything. Um, and so I went like practically raw vegan, um, for at least three months and then just took vegan for the, the, the following three, four months. And it was so hard, um, for the first, like, you know, one and a half because, but I'm like, I just have to do it. Cause I, I saw the difference in my kid and all of a sudden she wasn't like screaming all night and she was happier. And it was because I, I was breastfeeding, by the way, if people weren't connecting that, um, <laughs> like she could just sense She's my happier energy with you as a person. <laughs> She's like, I don't want you to eat that anymore. I don't want you to eat that anymore. Um, but, but then all of a sudden it was like, I started to realize how much better I felt <laughs> like I didn't feel nearly as, as crazy stressed all the time and like Becca I was always constipated and I was actually like having bowel movements like twice a day and I'm like what is this <laughs> this is incredible I feel Witchcraft. so good <laughs> no literally and that's how and that's how it felt and then even then once I got back into kind of my normal uh like diet once uh Ember wasn't breastfeeding anymore I started to realize the certain things when I would eat them that I was like, oh, that makes me feel sick. And I think before I was like focusing on any sort of like trigger eating, like mm -hmm. I, I just, I didn't realize until afterwards that I just wasn't in tune at all with my body. And mm -hmm. so I didn't realize, cause I just thought like, oh, I don't get stomach aches after I eat like some of my friends do. So I don't have any sort of like trigger food. Mm -hmm. And then once I started eating, have it like eating my normal diet again after Ember stopped breastfeeding, I was like, oh, I'm getting like really bad headaches again. And I'm getting like weird brain fog and I'm not as regular in the bathroom anymore. And I started to put, you know, it seems so obvious, but like I just wasn't in tune with my body at all. And then all of a sudden after that, I was able to kind of put two and two together a little bit. And I'm like, oh, Maybe the dairy's not, you know, necessarily your friend so much, even though you're a cheese queen. <laughs> you know and that's I'm why I, I like an elimination diet because it's yeah. not a, I, I don't like when there's long-term restrictive diets, again, yeah. unless you have an allergy and it's a food that doesn't agree with you. There's no reason to restrict yourself more than you need to and to create a complex kind of around food, even if it's a... Mm healthy kind of complex, but yeah. an elimination diet is for a set amount of time. So six to eight weeks, you know that it's going to end and you know that you can reintroduce these foods and you're more just giving your body a chance to speak to you like with the headaches. Cause mm. often we're eating these things every single day that we're allergic to. And we don't realize the level of pain that we're living in. And we don't yeah. realize that food allergies can affect things even like our sleep. Um, I'll never forget when I cut out one of my allergens that all of a sudden I started not being a light sleeper anymore. I didn't have the shoulder pain sleeping on my side. Mm. So all of these things that I thought were just part of being a human and, you know, everybody has pain when they sleep, everybody wakes <laughs> up with an achy neck was changing for me. And when you give yourself the chance to notice those things, that's when you really start to develop a relationship with your body. Mm -hmm. And in those six to eight weeks, it really does suck. But like you said, there's like a withdrawal period. Your taste buds do get retrained over time. And you can even kind of speed up the process by exposing your taste buds to really bitter, bad tasting stuff like herbs. So one of the things that I use, um, especially when I am going to have a treat and eat something that my body doesn't agree with is digestive bitters. So all bitter plants are actually going to send a signal from the bitter taste receptors on your tongue to your brain, then to your stomach to encourage the production of stomach acid, which will then signal the release of digestive enzymes and the release of bile, which is something that we really need to break down fats and will actually make digestion a lot 
easier, which is why they're called digestive bitters. You take them 15 minutes before a meal. Mm. And all cultures really have some form of this. So I'm Italian. In the Italian culture, we do bitter endives before a meal or some kind of an, uh, a digestive drink with bitter herbs before a meal to get the juices flowing. And at first, when you start taking digestive bitters, like a tincture of it, it's disgusting. It is horrible <laughs> and you hate it. And then all of a sudden, it starts to not be so bad. And then in a few weeks, you actually start to crave that flavor before your meal and you find that your taste buds are more open to different culinary flavors and different uh, flavor notes in vegetables because they're bitter, but they're nowhere near as bitter as the herbs. So even mm, herbs can kind of be a tool to retrain your taste buds. Oh, that's fascinating. So do you have like in, in your like social media internet world, do you have some sort of like step-by-step -step program or like how do people get started? Cause I know I even have family members and friends who are like, I have all these fucking issues. I just don't even know where to start an elimination diet. What do I start eliminating? What signs am I looking for? Like, do I keep my diet, the rest of my diet, the way it is like, how do you, how do, where do you recommend people start when they're like ground zero? That's a really zero? good question. And, and you know what? I, I more and more, I'm realizing that that's what people need. As I get into this field and go deeper and look at the science of it, I almost overcomplicate things, but really what the average person needs is just where do I start and how can you see <laughs> tell me what to do right, right. So, you know what well I don't personally have the yeah. the step-by-step -step guide yet <laughs> perhaps that'll be my next project I would say to you can really easily google if you type in like elimination diet pdf or elimination diet guide there are some really great ones out there is I that where you would recommend people starting just in general if they're having yes, health issues okay for sure with an elimination diet because you, you really do have to know what foods set you off because for some people, even the healthiest of foods can still create issues for them. And you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, but I'm eating so much healthier and yet I still feel like crap. So it yeah. must not work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we all have such unique intolerances. My friend who has rosacea, oddly enough, she cannot go near chia seeds or flax seeds or else she'll have a severe rosacea flare. And those are two healthy foods that are in like every right. free cracker product known to man. Right. So even when you're making substitutions and you're, you're going for something like a gluten-free bread or a natural kind of cracker, there still might be ingredients in there that are causing issues for you. So on yeah. an elimination diet, you're cutting out nuts, seeds, grains, gluten, dairy, um, corn, which is a grain and soy, right? You're cutting out all those food groups because sometimes things like nuts and seeds can be a trigger for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's temporary. Yeah, like oats cause me inflammation, for instance. Exactly. Grains do it for a lot of people. And I think part of that is because, um, you know, having a grain heavy diet is something that's relatively new when you look at human history. And it's also going back to quality and preparation. So if you're soaking your oats and you're sprouting them mm -hmm. and you're soaking your beans overnight, they're going to be a lot easier to digest. But so many of us skip that step. And when you're introducing something like beans, you can do a test on yourself and have straight up canned beans in a meal, see how you feel, or soak and sprout your beans and cook them to get rid of some of the phytic acid and the irritating anti-nutrients that cause the gut issues and see how you feel then. But you need the clean slate of cutting them out for a while. So when you're on an elimination diet, a lot of people are like, I can't eat grains. What am I having for carbs? And fruits and roots are your best friends. And I, to me, that's like kind of the perfect human diet. Um, fruits, roots, and protein, right? So I do a lot of plantain. I love plantains so much. I'll fry them in the morning, have them with eggs. Um, I'll take like, you know, sweet potato, regular potato, any kind of tubers, roots, and starches that are not grains are something that's great to substitute while you're on an elimination diet and to really lean into those and to have a lot more fruit and a lot of color, um, to eat more vegetables, put more of those on your plate and don't be afraid of protein. I know that there's a lot of debate in terms of vegan and meat eaters and carnivore and so many different ideologies out there, but really meat is one of the only foods that's not a food allergen. No one is really allergic to meat. So if you're sourcing it really well and putting a lot of care into how you're sourcing it, who you're getting it from, knowing your farmers, 
Um, I think that it is an excellent addition to a diet and it's something that really helps me um, and helps me to just feel sane and grounded and stable. So I eat a lot of meat in my diet, but I also eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and, and root vegetables. Yeah, and it's difficult because people might have different access to different things, right? So it's yeah. like some people may be living in food deserts and may only have access to, you know, whatever foster farms chicken and they might have to for whatever reason then they may want to make the decision of like well i'm not going to go this route because i'm not getting you know i'm getting yeah. animals that are pumped up with antibiotics and all these other things absolutely um, and if that's the case and that's what you have access to then that's probably not the best diet for you and you'd have to find other protein sources and do something like soaking beans and sprouting beans and using that as a protein source or going for something like um, getting some canned wild salmon which would or canned wild tuna which would be a lot cheaper even than the non-organic chicken right and kind of making yeah. these substitutions so mm. um, for me I'll do like a lot of that's a great canned. suggestion yeah, I, I just take some canned salmon and I'll add either like a homemade mayo or even a store-bought mayo, whatever you have access to, or a fourth of an avocado and I'll mash it together and just eat it on some crackers. And to me, that's like the perfect definition of fast food. Mm. Yeah. Also, if if people do have the resources or the financial resources, do you recommend people starting out like consulting with like an herbalist or a naturopath or like... Is there, what are the other resources that are helpful for people to supplement when yeah. they're starting? So if you, journey? usually with herbalists, what we're taught in school is to do always a sliding scale. Like a lot of herbalism mm. is ethics and conscious uh, capitalism. That's what my teachers call it, conscious capitalism. So I'm going to start practicing in a few months where I was supposed to start this month, but with everything with my parents and my dad mm. living with me, it's, it's a whole thing. But the way I will be structuring my practice with clients is that I'll take a certain amount of clients each month that either can't pay at all or can pay X amount that works for them. And then the clients who can pay full price, I will gladly take that to support my business. So um, usually that's the, that's the cool thing about working with an herbalist is that mm. they're taught that way from their teachers because it is kind of a community-based art of healing and that is drilled into our minds to always make sure that accessibility is part of what we do um, and so herbalists will do that in terms of some will ask a questionnaire like how many times a month can you afford to go out to eat and they'll use that hmm. as a marker of okay this is how much i would charge you you know it's just kind of like using those questions instead of flat out rudely asking someone how much do you make or how much can you afford sure using questions that kind of gauge what a person is able to spend and charging them fairly based on that because it's a human to human exchange. It's not just, here's my fee. If you can't take it, get away. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely seeking out an herbalist, especially one who will work on a sliding scale and doing the elimination diet with them, coming to your herbalist and saying, hey, the reason I'm coming to you is because I want to change my diet. I've heard about an elimination diet. Can you guide me through that and walk me through that? Mm. Um, and, and for me, when I do work with clients, I will always ask them their top three concerns. Cause usually people come in with a laundry list of things that they want to work on, but what are the top three things that I can help you with the most? Um, and, and we'll focus on that first. And usually you're working with an herbalist long-term over like six months to a year to really make sure that you see results. Um, and they can be your guide, your friend, your sounding board. It, it's really a collaboration. It's not just, I know what's best for your body. Because what mm. I find is, is when I'm talking to someone about their symptoms or their health, in the conversation, they already know what the root issue is. They're telling me mm. what's wrong with them. They'll say, oh, well, when I do this or when I have a fight with my husband or I get really stressed or I feel alone, I start to get this pain. Or, you know, like they, they already know what's at the root of their own issue. So you just kind of have to listen and be the person that reflects back to them and can recognize certain herbal tools that can help them through that process of moving through that. Mm. Okay, Broads, can we pause for a second and talk about a gift? This is a gift for kitties and kitty owners alike. It's pretty, it's litter. It's pretty litter. Uh, cats are notorious for hiding their illnesses, but with Pretty Litter's mm. health detecting formula, there's no secrets. Pretty Litter is the world's smartest kitty litter. Their propri proprietary formula changes colors to help detect early signs of potential illness, including urinary tract infections and kidney issues. 
And unlike other conventional litters that contain ingredients and additives that may be damaging to your cat's health, Pretty Litter is created from naturally occurring minerals and is safe for your cat. And Pretty Litter arrives safely at my door, which is especially great right now. I do not want to have to run to the store for something like cat litter. And it arrives in a small lightweight bag that lasts up to a month. And if you get the litter bags auto shipped, you don't have to deal with last minute trips to the store at all. Shipping's free. Uh, my dad uses Pretty Litter, and I know that he also loves the odor trapping capabilities of Pretty Litter. Uh, you aren't smelling it throughout the house. And also, Pretty Litter is designed with that specialized de-dusting process, making it virtually dust-free so you can say bye to kitty paw prints all over the house and sneezes. So get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com and using promo code CHATTY for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com, promo code chatty for 20% off. Prettylitter.com, promo code chatty. I have a question. So when people are coming to you and even just on your platforms, because I know with like your podcast or YouTube or your Instagram, you'll have what I love because it's digestible, especially for someone like me, where you're like, we're going to talk about stress or we're going to talk about your period or we're going to talk about acne. And then you explain the herbs. And I love that because I'm able to like digest that. What are a few of the top things that people like come to you for or the most interested oh, yeah, in like, I a, need this fix? That's a good question. <laughs> definitely digestion and definitely hormones. Like when you mentioned okay. your period, absolutely. Um, and I think that that's, even when I'm working with someone personally, that's the, the first few things that I kind of want to correct right off the bat. Because if you're not eating, digesting, and absorbing your food. And if you're not sleeping right, like let's just look at sleep as a driver of hormonal imbalance. Those are your two pillars of health. So if those aren't okay. functioning, you can have 500 symptoms because of them, but these are the root pillars that we really need to work on. Um, so I always address someone's digestion, whether through diet changes um, and also through digestive bitters, probiotics, um, perhaps doing some sort of an antimicrobial um, gut reset, like the one that I originally did for my health. And I really work with people on mindfulness around eating too, right? Like that's one of the biggest aspects of digestion that we're missing is that we're not getting into parasympathetic rest and digest mode before we eat. And that's another one of these kind of cultural traditions that we've forgotten. Even something as simple as saying a prayer before a meal, even if you're not religious and you just want to say a prayer to the universe, mm. that actually gets your nervous system completely into a mode where it is now ready to secrete your stomach acid and secrete all of the fluids that you need to properly digest something. Mm. But so many people are eating on the go. Um, you know, their, their boss doesn't even give them a minute to eat or they're eating at their desk or they're eating while they're walking or they don't have the luxury of taking that time. So just helping people to find those little rituals and practices that can bring them solace and mindfulness before they dive into a meal that will correct it in a way where they don't even need to buy anything. Um, and again, I also work with physical tools like digestive bitters. That's my number one uh, formula that I give to everyone in my practice. I always okay. put someone on a digestive bitters tincture. Do and you have them by the way in your shop? Yes. The one okay. I make is called digestive juice and it's a spray. So okay. you can spray it on your tongue, like six to 10 sprays, 15 minutes before a meal. But there are so many companies that make digestive bitters. People definitely don't have to use mine. And also if I'm working with a client personally where I'm making custom formulas for them and they have a known hormone imbalance, I will use specific digestive bitter herbs that also have a function on the liver and also um, improve liver detoxification because your liver is what actually gets rid of and excretes your excess serum hormones like estrogen that cause estrogen dominance and PCOS and mm. uh, PMS. Mm. And if you can kill two birds with one stone, a lot of liver herbs happen to be digestive bitters. So I'll try to consolidate as much as possible for people and I'll make them liver bitters or hormone bitters where we're working on their hormone health and their um, eliminate elimination functions while we're also working on their digestion. And then for sleep, a lot of people will think that if I'm not sleeping well, I actually have to take something before bed to help it. But you getting tired at night is not something that happens at night. It's something that you're working on all day long. So you have to address other parts of your day to get 
fully tired at night. Um, and we can do a few different things to correct that and to get someone tired at the time that they're actually supposed to be tired. Um, we can have them wake up earlier when the sun is coming up so they can expose their eyes to that blue light and the initial light of a sunrise, which will totally reset their circadian rhythm. We can use adaptogenic herbs. I know that's like a big buzzword, ashwagandha, eleuthero, all my favorite adaptogens because those will also reset the HPA axis and the circadian rhythm. And it's taking a top-down approach to these issues instead of using the medical model, which is like taking a pill before bed or even taking an herb before bed. It starts way before that, just like digestion starts before a meal when you're getting into this mode mm. of parasympathetic rest and digest. Hmm. And you have your the first episode of your podcast, What's the Juice? Yes. Gets into the HBA axis, which I didn't know about. So that's like a great broad if you wanna we'll we'll link it in the episode notes, but that's a great like starting point to process and understand all of that. Cause yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> so that was very informative to me. <laughs> yes, your hy your HPA axis. It's your hypothalamus pituitary adrenals, and then it's even the HPAOT. So it includes the ovaries and the thyroid. So sometimes a hormone imbalance in the ovaries is actually an imbalance that's happening in the adrenals from stress or in the hypothalamus from not being exposed to natural sunlight at a certain time. So it's kind of going back to basics to how does the body speak to itself? Where are these feedback loops and how can we get to the very beginning of the issue? Again, rather than putting a Band-Aid on it. I'm wondering how, if you have any tips also for people who maybe have chronic medical issues or maybe are pregnant and seen an OB or skin issues, seen a dermatologist. Do you have any tips for how to align what you're trying to achieve um, through using herbs or through using all these more holistic approaches and integrating that with your care provider because I know for me that's really hard and I also have an attitude and so I'm like I'm just not going to deal with them at all like I'm just going <laughs> to stop going to my dermatologist and I'm not going to see it because I don't want to I don't want to deal with that um but I know that's definitely not always possible and like you're saying like you're saying western medicine has its place and it's so valuable yeah. Um, how do you, how do you find a balance between those two? I was wondering if you had any tips for that. It's a tough one. I think that it's, when you think about Western medical professionals, you kind of have to speak their language and their language is peer reviewed science. And I also love peer reviewed science. I'm always looking on PubMed, seeing what new studies are being done on herbs or on pharmaceuticals. I want to know advancements that are being made that can make right. people's lives better. And that's what they want to know too. And yes. they're just very much trained that if there's not a peer reviewed study about it, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It can't possibly help. So it's a tough one because there's not a lot of money put into research on herbs because you can't patent them. You can't really profit it's off. It's not very profitable. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know what? I will say that we're living in a world where more of that research is being done and you can find some of it. And if you can, kind of become a detective that bridges the world and you can explain to your care provider in a way of here's the evidence that I found on this botanical um, and this is what the studies have shown would this be okay for me to incorporate alongside xyz that you're prescribing me and you come to them from that sense of I've done my research and I'm I'm really respecting you because I want right. to ask your professional opinion on integrating this rather than I don't want to take what you're giving me. Can I just try this? You kind of have to almost play that game a little bit. And yeah. that's what I was saying I did with my parents when they were in a in the hospital. Um, you know, my, my dad was given the hydroxychloroquine medication along with high doses of zinc. And my mom's doctor was only giving her the hydroxychloroquine. So I went on PubMed and I looked at studies on this drug and why it would possibly be combined with zinc. And I found studies showing that hydroxychloroquine is a zinc ionophore, meaning that it opens up the channel to get the zinc into the intracellular space where it can then halt viral replication because zinc is actually really good at fighting viruses. It just doesn't always get into the cell. So once I found those studies, I actually, when I called my mom's doctor at the hospital, I said, I will send you the links to these studies. They are peer reviewed. I found that it's this ionophore. And I think it would be really great if you can, if you would be willing to combine 
the zinc with the drug that she's on, just like they're doing for my dad. And because I sent him the study, he read it over and he called me back and said, you know, that was a really interesting find. Thank you. I'm going to put zinc in her regimen. So because I was able to just communicate it again in their language of here's what the science shows, they're more willing to listen to you when you've really kind of put the work in to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. And I guess going off of that, if you have a doctor that's not willing to listen to you, that's probably not a care provider that you want to keep seeing. Exactly. And I think more and more doctors are moving towards this functional integrative space where their patients are telling them, this really works for my rheumatoid arthritis, or this really helps my lupus or my digestive issues. Can you look into this? And because their patients are now educating them, they're becoming more curious. And of course, they want to provide the most comprehensive best care possible to you. So they'll be very willing to listen, especially when you approach them the right way. And like you said, if they're not they're they're not a doctor that is open to um, continuing education in a sense because we mm. have to remember that nobody knows a chronic condition better than the person who suffers from it. Mm. A person who suffers from a chronic medical issue is researching it every day on forums, talking to other people who have it, trying any and yes. everything, spending thousands of dollars sometimes on supplements and trial and error. And that patient experience is so valuable to a provider, even though That's it's so anecdotal. True. That's and so true. A good provider will listen to that patient. Mm. Yeah. I was just thinking about how me and my some of my friends, I have one friend in particular who struggled from the same kind of acne for the past 10 years. And we're always sending stuff to each other. And it's like we're <laughs> experts. We're like, we need to start a clinic for people that have this specific like skin problem because we n- now know so much about it because yes. we want to, like you're saying, if you have a chronic, con- any kind of chronic condition, especially a severe chronic illness you're gonna be like spending every waking moment trying to figure Mm -hmm. out how to not have it absolutely and yeah no you hit it right on the head and that's the cool part about the internet is that you can become a citizen scientist in a sense like you can really master especially something that you're going through in your own body um we have the world at our fingertips with the the age of information so we really should be empowered to research our condition Mm -hmm. and research the things that we're trying and bring that to professionals who can then use it and apply it to others. It's kind of like an each one teach one kind of situation. And I think patients really need to be listened to more. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's also really hard because when you're talking about studies, kind of like you were saying, you need funding in order to do research. And unfortunately, a lot of funding comes from pharmaceutical companies and so it's like the the research that's being done is then like it's a cycle of the same things being backed to be researched to be used because it's making money like an echo chamber for things that are profitable so and that's to me that's where tradition comes in so if there's something that i'm going to use on myself or with a client I need to have some convincing body of evidence to back up why I'm using that. Sometimes that's science and a study, and sometimes that's tradition that has been Mm -hmm. passed on for thousands of years that has not failed. It's Mm time-tested, and there's a lot of tradition around it, and it's something that's used by many professionals in that field. For example, Chinese herbs. A lot of them, there's not studies on the traditional Chinese formulas, but practitioners have used them with success for so many years and have documented that sex sex and have documented that success and have documented their results and observations and have made it better along the way. And if there's tradition behind something, I respect that often just as much as I respect science being behind something. Mm. That's true. I mean, if a culture has used something for thousands of years, that's a really, (laughs) that's a (laughs) lot of people continuing to choose to carry on this tradition for one reason or another. It doesn't always mean it's going to be the best choice, but I'm even thinking more about drugs that we do research on that then we do more research on five or 10 years down the road. And the reason we do more research on them is because then there's anecdotal evidence showing this or that negative outcome. And then we do more research and then come to find out maybe this isn't, yes, maybe this is harming people in this or that way. And so like a lot of the, and I'm not saying this to be like, fuck Western medicine. And I know people are going to hear it that way, but I'm just saying that when we develop something that's only been used five, 10 or 20 years, Mm -hmm. 
versus something that's been used thousands of years. We just do we do need to take a skeptical approach to everything. To everything. I think we to should everything. question everything. Yes. And and there's a lot of corruption in science. There's you know, people they can skew the way that they're uh, analyzing the statistics to have a certain result. And if you even look up if you Google Merck Viox CBS there's an article in CBS about, remember that drug Vioxx that ha- was in the news of like, if you took this drug in the last five, 10 yeah. years, you're entitled to compensation. So what Merck, this drug company did was they created their own basically fake research journal to publish their own skewed studies about Viox to get it approved to market. And there's so much corruption around, oh, and, and that's, again, it's in a mainstream news outlet. You can look up the article on CBS. So If a drug company is willing to fake articles and fake an entire research journal to get a drug fast-tracked and approved, and then we find out five, 10 years later that it caused all this harm, what else are they willing to do? So I think we just have to hold people accountable on all sides. And I think herbs are just naturally questioned, but we should also have that same questioning towards any medical procedure or pharmaceutical someone wants to give us. Well, it's so yeah, cool. Like when you're talking about what what happened with your with your parents, that you were able because you ha- have the knowledge and were able to research that, um, that you were able to advocate for your mom, mm-hmm. and then she her health improved. And I'm just thinking about even now, like the times that we're living in right now with like the pandemic and the nervousness and how everyone is just like, there's so many question marks, like, where is this coming from? Like, you know, like, why are certain people more prone and all these questions? Just even if something like herbs and what you guys are all talking about is not something that someone is maybe like off the bat passionate about. Yeah. It's like when you think about the power that you could have, first of all, within your own self to make sure that Mm. you're feeling your best, but just like the ability to be able to advocate for yourself in these situations, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And with the world and the state that it's in, it's like to have that ability to be able to like go through articles and understand, you know, the nuances of everything and be like, no, when I go somewhere, like I'm thankful for Western medicine, but I do want to be able to advocate for this because I Mm -hmm. do know that this is beneficial to me or has helped with my parents or whatever. And there are even sites, like if you go to sciencedaily.com, that's a website that will take you know, really advanced nuanced studies and write articles about these studies, kind of summarizing them in more layman's terms. Mm. Um, And they're always kind of posting new things that are coming out and new advancements. So you can even go on Science Daily and look up something, just search the, the term green tea. And you can find so many amazing studies that have been done on green tea for um, fatty liver, for obesity, for um, hormone disorders, for so many different, for microbiome issues and gut dysbiosis, so many different studies. And instead of having to wade through the study yourself on that website, someone has already written an article about it, explaining it. Here's the methods, here's what they did, and here's what they found in a much more digestible form. So often if I don't have time to sit there and read a full study or I can't get the full text, I'll go on to something like Science Daily and it makes it a lot easier. So that's kind of like a great uh, way to kind of improve the accessibility and the barrier to entry for starting to read about science. Hmm. That's so... Yeah, it's un- it's unfortunate. Right <laughs> I was gonna say it's unfortunate that so much power is taken out of our hands because, and sometimes I I'm always um, looking up studies just related to birth stuff, and a lot of times you have to be in medical school or have a subscription in order to even be able to access some it's of these studies. Terrible. I know, and I'm like, wait, what? I, so I because I I can't even look at this study and read this study for myself, and so I'll have to text my nurse friend and be like, can you I send know. me screenshots of this and log in? And yeah, I otherwise I'm gonna have to pay fifteen dollars. <laughs> I'm know? always I'm texting like, my doctor like, can you send me the the full PDF of this? <laughs> like, thank <laughs> God I have a good relationship with her. But what would I do if I didn't? Mm. You know, yeah. it's it's or, really or the. Yeah, or the means to interpret information because sometimes if you're just googling something like like I said I've been learning this with birth, if you google and you see this study like when you look at the outcome of the study immediately you're like, "Oh, well, this is how it is." And then if you have someone who's an expert yeah. providing nine non-biased judgment on it, they can look and they can tell you, "Well, here's the thing. 
This information is taken from death certificates, which is sometimes recorded by this per person or that person, not the actual person involved. And so that can skew the information in this direction. This is a study that's like a meta analysis. And so that means that these certain studies were left out, which means yeah. that we're not actually getting accurate data because these studies aren't being taken into consideration as well. And all this stuff that like, I didn't know most people don't know. And so it's really so much more complicated. Yeah. And, and it's new, and it's ever changing. A study will come out one day that says one thing and then a week later something says the opposite. It's always changing. The science is never settled, which is why again, I look towards tradition a lot of the times. What has passed the test of time rather than just being a new study that came out last mm -hmm. week. So I think it's so important to mix the two and yeah. to really and and that's where again traditional and cultural medicine comes in and learning from people who have preserved this knowledge for so many years. And so many of my teachers at my herbalism school, we had um, indigenous herbal practitioners come in. We had traditional Chinese practitioners come in and acupuncturists. We had Ayurvedic practitioners come in. So, you know, I, I have a lot of reverence and respect for all these cultures. And I try to always mention my teachers and the people who came before us and taught taught this art that are not even of my own culture that have been kind enough to share it with us because mm -hmm. their history is so rich. Um, so we really can't take that for granted. And, you know, we can't uh, poo poo something just because it's alternative, because oftentimes there's so many years of practice and experience behind that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank Good you stuff. so much for all of this. Like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm kind of like wired right now, and I want to like go on like a binge of diving in to all this. One of the beautiful things about having been quarantined is I'm like, I'm kind of getting more into this lifestyle, and I feel so much better, yes. and it's kind of like blowing my mind. It's <laughs> um, pretty cool to see people like running outside and exercising. Yeah, and like, okay, I can't go to a bar with my friends, but I could take a walk. Yeah, it's it's been it's kind of blown my mind. I'm like this girl over here didn't really ever exercise. And now it's like, OK, I'm, I'm exercising every day. I'm like trying to dive more into like healthy eating and like balance. And I just feel I'm like, whoa, why, why do I feel so good right now? I'm like, this well, all kind of makes sense. <laughs> Olivia, like you were saying too earlier, like imagine even if people aren't changing their diets at all, imagine the effect that it's having for us to eat our meals slowly yes. and to not yeah. be rushing out the door and to have less <gasps> stress and on to our have systems. to cook because eating out is expensive right now especially for people right. that lost their jobs so mm -hmm. right or getting more forced. sleep all yes. these kind of things even if you're not changing your your food habits i bet a lot of people are experiencing better health because of just these more like holistic things like getting better sleep and eating slower and not always yeah. being in the car like free medicine there's so much free medicine sunlight community connection you know movement there's so much out there and and especially again as someone who has a company and a, a for-profit supplement line I always try to mm. emphasize that first is there's so many things you can do before you ever buy a product mm. from me mm, I love that and I love and I just wanted to thank you because I know for myself um, sometimes, uh, diving into the whole like food element of all of this, I would always run from because it had been like a trigger for me just because my brain right away goes to diet culture where I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, it's just about like, it's about losing weight. Right. And that, that then would trigger me with like my past eating, um, uh, my past eating disorders. And, um, so someone like you, and when I've like been diving into all of your info, I just want to thank you because it's just so focused on just like knowing your body and living a, a life that is like full of like health in all ways. Like, and it just allowed me to feel balanced where like I wasn't running from it. Cause I'm like, I don't want to go there because I'll just avoid it and continue to do what I'm doing. And yeah. like, because of people like you where I'm able to like, okay, I'm able to dive into this and feel like, no, this is about making sure that like my body is like getting the oxygen it needs, getting the type of nutrients that it needs to feel my sharpest and most joyful self. So I just want to thank you for that and all those services that you're providing for. Thank you. That like was myself. so sweet. I really appreciate no, I, I, I deeply appreciate you. And can you let all of our broads know where they can find you, all of your store herbs, all this? <laughs> 
Oh, and we'll put it in the episode notes too. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, my Instagram is at organic underscore Olivia because some chick totally took the full name without the underscore. Wow. Um, <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> and my website is organicolivia.com. Um, that's where I have not only my herbal formulas that you guys can shop, but I have a ton of blog posts on there from back when blogging was all the rage. Um, but now I have pivoted to my podcast. It's called What's the Juice? And yeah, I talk about things like stress and getting into parasympathetic mode more often. And I interview a lot of really cool guests and I'm a chatty broads fan till I die. So <laughs> yay! <laughs> well, we love you and we so appreciate you for coming on. Of course. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for having me. You guys are awesome. <laughs> All right, Chat broads. Soon, broads. Chat soon. Chat soon.